uh, to most of you, Keith Moffat needs no introduction. As you know, uh, Keith um, was a student of George Batchelor uh, and has been associated with the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics in Cambridge uh, for almost all of his uh, professional career. Um, and um, uh, he is uh, honored in many ways. He's a fellow of the Royal Society um, and has made many fundamental contributions to fluid mechanics uh, in topological areas in uh, MHD and is of course famous for Moffat eddies. Uh, these eddies take place in corners in, in very low Reynolds number flows. So it's a great pleasure to have uh, Keith uh, round up this uh, series. Keith was the honorary chair of the Bachelor Symposium um, and uh, gave a talk uh, during the, uh, the online symposium in March about George's life and he's going to wind up this series and I'm just going to hand over to Keith at this point. So over to you, Keith. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for these very kind words of uh, introduction. And thank you for inviting me to give this uh, concluding lecture in the Bachelor Centenary Celebration. I want first to pay tribute to all the lecturers that we've heard in the webinar, webinar series this term. We've had a wonderful diet of presentations from Japan, the Netherlands, USA, France, and China, as well as the UK itself. And I congratulate the organizers for putting together such an excellent and varied program. Um, these lectures, as Paul has said, uh, would have been given at the IUTAM Symposium held back in March, if this had been held physically in Cambridge, but the pandemic intervened and the symposium had to be held virtually online. One great advantage, of course, is that the lectures become much more widely available. And it's great that we can now look back on all these lectures on YouTube. So a big thank you to all the speakers who have contributed to this great uh, commemorative series. Um, in the talk that I gave back in March, I should have mentioned Bachelor's involvement with China, and I do so now particularly because we've had two talks from China, uh, including today's uh, very nice presentation from Lang Zhu. Um, and uh, it's appropriate to mention Bachelor's involvement, which goes back a long way. Uh, I think it probably goes back to 1946, uh, when Bachelor had just recently arrived in Cambridge to work with G.I. Taylor. And you see here on the left a photograph of Zhu Peiyuan, um, who was um, yeah, at that time a young Chinese researcher in the field of turbulence. And he visited Cambridge, no doubt, to uh, talk with G.I. Taylor, but he would certainly have met George Batchelor as well. And Batchelor did refer to uh, Zhu Peiyuan's work in some of his uh, subsequent papers. Uh, Zhu Pei, Pei, Pei Wan um, uh, was uh, president of Peking, Peking University. Um, Bachelor actually visited China in April 1980, uh, hosted by Zhu, uh, and again in 1983. These visits helped to initiate collaboration between fluid dynamicists in China and Europe. Um, in 1978, uh, coming forward a bit, the General Assembly of IUTAM met in London, hosted by James Lighthill. China was represented by Zheng Jimin, his photograph is here, <coughs> of the China's, uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences, and uh, Wang Ren of Peking University. Their presence at this gathering just two years after the death of Mao Zedong made a very deep impression. And it was in fact their presence there that led to Bachelor's 
a visit just two years later in April 1980. Um, uh, I'm indebted to John Shee, uh, who gave me this photograph, this early photograph of uh, Zhu Pei Yuan. Uh, he has written a nice article published in the Notes and Records of the Royal Society, uh, George Keith Batchelor's Interaction with Chinese Fluid Dynamicists and Inspirational Influence, a Historical Perspective. And here is the reference to that paper. Now, I want, uh, as I said in my abstract, to discuss briefly <clears throat> three rather, well, problems that I find quite fascinating. I have worked on over the years, and uh, there are still open questions relating to these problems, which I touched on in my JFM Perspectives paper in the volume 914, which contains all the uh, lectures of the IUTAM Symposium. And here are the three questions. Firstly, how are corner eddies affected by increasing the Reynolds number of the remote forcing? Very natural question. Particularly interesting as the Reynolds number becomes very large. Secondly, how does a sheet of air enter through the free surface cusp in a tightly controlled situation? That's the free surface cusp um, that develops, that can develop in a viscous flow when you have a competition between viscous forces and surface tension. And thirdly, how can knotted or linked magnetic flux tubes most efficiently jump from one minimum energy state to another. So first uh, question, how are corner eddies affected by increasing the Reynolds number of the remote forcing? I think you're all familiar with this sort of picture. If you have two fixed plates on which uh, you have no slip condition, and you generate a flow, for example, by a rotating cylinder out here at some distance from the corner, then you generate an eddy, which actually separates. I call this Stokes separation, because this is low Reynolds number flow. It separates and reattaches and generates a second eddy. And if this happens once, it's going to happen again with a separation here and a reattachment here. And if it happens here, it's going to happen yet again, and so on ad infinitum. In principle, there are an infinite sequence of eddies, but in practice, it's very difficult to observe more than two or three of them. Here was an experiment, a famous experiment, carried out by Taneda in uh, 1979, um, in which he generated a flow in precisely this way, rotating a cylinder here, driving a primary vortex. You see very clearly the Stokes separation at this point and the reattachment here, um, and the generation of a second eddy. And if you have a good imagination, you can see the third eddy here. The reason it's difficult to observe this is evident here. If the time scale of circulation is, say, 10 seconds in the first eddy, then it would be one hour in the second eddy. It would be 16 days in the third eddy. The factor is about 400 for this angle, and it would be 17 years for the fourth eddy. So you need a great deal of patience to observe more than even two in this sequence. Um, the uh, um, Reynolds number in Taneda's experiment was of order unity, perhaps between one and 10. Um, so that is the situation at very low Reynolds number. Now, um, Emmanuel Dormy, um, with whom I've been collaborating recently, has uh, just within the last week or two produced these beautiful figures of what happens in the related problem of a, a channel, a deep channel flow, it's a often called a rectangular cutout, where you have a plate on the top boundary which moves 
to the right with a velocity u and a Reynolds number is based on the velocity of that plate and the width of this channel. That obviously generates a flow. And when the Reynolds number is small, the flow separates here. Again, Stokes separation and reattaches here. The Reynolds number of the second eddy is very much less than the Reynolds number of the first because of this decrease. It's actually an exponential decrease from one eddy to the next as you go down. Here, this uh, is terminated after at this point here, and you have corner eddies in this right, these right angled corners. The Reynolds number here, roughly 0 0.0036, so certainly very small. This flow is pretty well symmetric, exactly symmetric about the center line. If the Reynolds number is increased to 100, that symmetry is broken. And uh, the Reynolds number of the second eddy is now of order one, 1 1.03 in fact, of course, it depends exactly how you uh, define this Reynolds number, but of order one. And uh, if you increase to 500, the flow becomes more nearly, one would say circular here, circular streamlines. Um, and the Reynolds number of the second eddy is now 63. The ratio of Re prime to Re increases as you move, as you increase this basic Reynolds number, which is an interesting point. I don't know if it's been recorded before, but uh, there was a very early and important paper by Pan and Akrivos, 1967, in which they did initial computations uh, for this geometry, uh, increasing the Reynolds number in precisely this way. They noted that the vorticity tends to become uniform. Uh, the vorticity is represented by the green curve here. It may be hidden for you, but it's the green curve uh, and you see a, a bit of a plateau with two boundary layers beginning to develop. There's a boundary layer here and a boundary layer on the top plate. And there's a, actually also a boundary layer again with a no slip condition on the right hand side. And here's the second eddy driven by the first across some kind of shear layer. Um, so this is the sort of situation that we'd like to describe theoretically. And here I remind you of the paper, famous paper by Batchelor in volume one of JFM, 1956. And this is the paper that led to what is known as the prantl batchelor theorem. There's the amazing paper of Prantl in 1904 in the proceedings of an early mathematical congress in Heidelberg. I say amazing because that's the paper where boundary layer theory was first developed by Prantl. And as a very short aside, uh, he uh, mentioned uh, in passing this, uh, re this uh, result, slightly conjectured, but he gave reasons for believing that the vorticity should be uniform in a flow of this kind with closed streamlines in any region of closed streamlines. Batchelor solved the problem for this case of a cylinder uh, which is rotating and you have a sleeve here, uh, a fixed sleeve of angle. He had the angle two, two pi sigma. Um, and uh, this uh, leads, you have a, well, he had the cylinder rotating this way. So uh, constant angular velocity on this portion and no slip on this portion. This leads to a flow with uniform vorticity inside a boundary layer. And Batchelor sol solved the problem of the boundary layer flow and determined the magnitude of the vorticity in the interior. Well, now with the corner, imagine this situation. Suppose we have the rotating cylinder and we place two plates here, again, fixed plates. So we have this driving at this uh, point here. If it's a low Reynolds number, then we'll certainly have the corner eddy sequence here. If we increase the Reynolds number, then the question is, to what extent is the prantl bachelor theorem correct? in a complex domain such as D, or we could imagine fluid also in the domain D prime, and you get a flow up here 
down here, trying to turn the corner, presumably separating, driving a secondary eddy, and God knows what goes on in this region here. Um, so that's the question. What is the flow, firstly, in D, particularly in the limit? I'd like to know the flow in the limit as the Reynolds number goes to infinity and in D prime. It's interesting because there will be boundary layer separation um, and boundary layer separation at high Reynolds number is one of the, still one of the extremely challenging problems of fluid dynamics. And we certainly have separation here. And if you go back to this, uh, I'm sorry, I've gone on instead of back, previous, previous, back to this situation, it looks as if the position of this separation becomes fixed. It tends to a fixed location as the Reynolds number increases. But again, theoretically interesting to determine exactly where that position is and what is going on in that neighborhood. So that, as I say, is the first open problem that I would like to pose. And it's a problem that um, Emmanuel and I are making a little progress on already at the moment. Second problem, how does a sheet of air enter through the free service cusp in a tightly controlled situation? And this is the situation that I have in mind, two cylinders below the free surface of a viscous fluid. And in this photograph, the viscous fluid is golden syrup. It's a fluid that was a favorite of G.I. Taylor in some of his experiments, and for very good reason that you can actually uh, enjoy the taste of this uh, syrup when you've finished the experiment. Anyway, if you um, rotate these at sufficient uh, speed, but still low Reynolds number, then a cusp develops here, a very sharp cusp. Um, and a strange phenomenon here, which I'll mention in a moment. I should say that this is a phenomenon that we demonstrated to Prince Philip when he came and opened the Isaac Newton Institute in October 1992. And you may recognize some of the other figures in this photograph. Well, um, we can model this problem in this way uh, with a free surface uh, and the effect of the two cylinders being represented by a vortex dipole placed at a depth d below the undisturbed free surface. That's the depth of the free surface at infinity. Near to the um, what looks like a cusp, you have um, this force of surface tension acting upwards at an effective uh, position, center of a circle of curvature, which may have a radius of order r, the radius of curvature at this point. Now, the exact solution of this problem, which is given this paper in 1992, gives a rather extraordinary result that the ratio of R radius of curvature here to the depth D is 265 over 3 exponential minus 32 pi times the capillary number defined in this way. Alpha, the strength of the vortex dipole, mu, of course, viscosity, gamma, surface tension. If that capillary number is equal to one, then D over R evaluates to the ridiculously large value, 5.3 times 10 to the power of 41. Uh, the reciprocal of order 10 to the minus 41, of course. Um, I say ridiculous because it's less than the radius of the proton if um, the dimensions of this apparatus are, say, of order 10 centimeters. Um, but here I like to note this point, um, and it was made by Feynman in his lectures in 1963. He was commenting on the ratio of the electrostatic repulsion of two electrons to their gravitational attraction. And that number is 4.17 times 10 to the power of 42, a huge number. And he says, where could such a tremendous number come from? Some say that we shall one day find the 
quote, a universal equation. And in it, one of the roots will be this number. It is very difficult to find an equation for which such a fantastic number is a natural root. Well, here we have a problem in uh, classical fluid mechanics, where uh, when you have the, an input parameter of order one, the output dimensionless parameter is this huge number. This is an exact solution of the Stokes equations and uh, with the uh, exact boundary condition on uh, this free surface, just viscosity and surface tension. So such numbers can arise. In a sense, it's an order one number, but it's a very large order one number. Okay, now what happens if you bring the cylinders very close together? Uh, and here is a picture I took back of this experiment back in the 1990s. Here is the very thin sheet of air that is drawn through the cusp. And this is a phenomenon that was considered by Eggers in a very nice paper in uh, 2001. This thin sheet of air could be analyzed, I'm sure, by lubrication theory. However, it uh, leads to the formation of what I describe as a tricus tricuspidal air bubble three cusps here, here, and here. And uh, the question is, again, the open problem to explain the formation of this tri tricuspidal bubble. Difficult word to say over and over again, tricuspidal. Um, again, there's a very good review paper by Kumar et al in 2017 about the air entrainment problem in situations of this kind. But this issue of explaining the formation of the tricuspidal bubble is open. Um, and uh, this is what actually happens as the capillary number increases slowly from zero. When it's extremely small, the surface is quite, uh, the curvature is quite finite. You see this is the form. But if you increase the speed here, you, on which the capillary number depends, then the cusp and the sheet of air develop and become quite pronounced. Um, and this <coughs> form, this shape becomes sort of stabilized with increasing capillary number. Still of order unity, certainly not large. To explain the formation of this tricuspidal bubble and lubrication theory obviously may be a help in this matter. My third problem, and I'll have to uh, speed up a little on this one, it will be familiar to those of you who work in magnetohydrodynamics. Um, and it relates to the minimum energy state of a topologically complex situation. And here I imagine a magnetic flux tube in the form of a trefoil knot. Uh, T23, it's usually described, um, if that is allowed to relax in a perfectly conducting medium by any means that extracts energy from the knot, then it can relax to a minimum energy situation, situation where it's now described for ob obvious reasons as a tight knot. And this is the form of that tight knot. During that process, there are two quantities that are conserved. One is the flux phi of magnetic field in the tube, and the other is the volume of the tube if this is happening in an incompressible fluid. There's also a helicity parameter that is conserved, and here I've taken h equal to three. It rather corresponds to the three crossings of the trefoil knot, so that in the flattened position, there's no additional uh, internal twist. That parameter is also conserved. The alternative shape is uh, T32, which has a different symmetry from the T23, but it's actually the same knot. In other words, you can deform T23 to T32 by a continuous deformation, and you can play with a knotted rope and establish, convince yourself that this is the case. That will relax T23 
to a different form with a different symmetry. Now it's known that the energy of a tight knot has this form, it has to have this form, m, a dimensionless coefficient, a function of the dimensionless h, times phi squared divided by volume to the one third. Um, my former student, Atachui, and I, in 1995, wrote a paper on this subject, uh, which uh, showed this figure, the minimum, the energy, the function m of h, in effect, for T32 and T23, and at the parameter value 3, h equals 3, you see that the energy of T32, this one, is greater than the energy of T23 by a, a relatively small amount, 40 as compared with 37. Um, I was motivated to look at this again by a paper that appeared in Science this year on the 1st of January. Um, you hear my clock striking five <laughs> there in the background. I'm sorry about that. Um, this paper um, shows, discusses uh, a metamorphic protein, a long chain molecule that has two equilibrium states, two, two different forms, uh, and one can convert to the other uh, given suitable input of energy. And uh, the authors of this paper argue the relevance of this process to evolution of the human uh, genome effectively over a very long period of 350 million years. So this is the motivation for looking at this problem. You might say that this transformation is rather like the transformation from T23 to T32. Well, how can it happen? You take T23 in the tight form, expand it, deform it, and contract it, and that is the process by which you can achieve this change. The deformation is quite intricate. You can achieve this by stretching one of the lobes of the knot, twisting it through a pie, and folding it back again through pie behind the basic structure so that the symmetry is changed. And that is how you can achieve the deformation by stretch, twist, fold, and then symmetrize process, a very familiar process in dynamo theory. Well, that's, uh, there are other things, but I think I have to finish there for lack of time. So I will jump to my final slide, uh, which it seems appropriate to quote since we're celebrating George Batchelor. This is repeating what uh, Howard Stone said in his lecture back in March. And I quote from Batchelor's paper, Research as a Lifestyle, 1997, um, through having common objectives and principles by which new knowledge is assessed and disseminated, scientists concerned with a particular field like fluid mechanics form an international community of great unity and moral strength. I believe that the understanding, trust and goodwill between members of this scientific community transcends geographical and political boundaries and constitutes one of the most important forces for international harmony and friendship in the world today. I think we've seen this well illustrated in the uh, symposium back in March and in the webinar series that we've heard this term. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Keith. Uh, as always, a brilliant lecture. Wonderful. So I just uh, reiterate, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat. I have one here from uh, Herbert Huppert. He asks you, Keith, in your first uh, section, you told us of the different turnover times of neighboring eddies. What about the difference in initiation times? Um, well, it's a Stokes flow, Herbert. And uh, if you um, st start from rest and then simply start as Taneda did by say rotating 
the cylinder at some distance from the corner, then according to the theorems of Stokes flow, the steady solution is established instantaneously um, and is unique. Um, this means that in fact, amazingly, all these eddies are established um, in principle, you might say, instantaneously um, within the Stokes approximation. Of course, if you um, if you're re realistic and allow for the time dependent Stokes problem, as it were, include du by dt in the equation, then uh, there will be a very small time of establishment of the flow, but it'll get there extremely rapidly, and uh, all the uh, all these little eddies in principle will be present. And coming back to the point about increasing the Reynolds number, that presumably is no longer true then. I, I think that's that's true. That's Once a very good question. It becomes finite. Yeah, absolutely. And so that could be a subsidiary, subsidiary open question. Right. Of course, um, when the Reynolds number is large, uh, one of the computing techniques is to uh, you to use to go to the unsteady problem and let it uh, settle down. And uh, one would automatically find how long it takes to settle to the steady state. Yeah. And Herbert again has another question. Why could the capillarity number not be larger than one in your second free oh, surface? It can be. Uh, yeah, it can be larger than one, but it doesn't need to be. Um, well, of course, if you make it too large, if you really increase the speed, then little instabilities do develop in the experiment. Uh, the air, the, that little column of air begins to wiggle about and bubbles are shed from the two cusps at the bottom of the tricuspidal uh, bubble um, and, and, and so on. So there are complications, additional complications, if you increase the capillary number, but there's no reason why you shouldn't do so. Okay, thank you. From uh, John Whitlaffer. Surely well before the cusp reaches the incredible depth predicted, it will break down by van der Waals interactions. When is that? Um, the, this, when the two cylinders are close together, I imagine you mean? I presume so. Uh, the, the, it's true, the, uh, the two, there are two films uh, on, the on both cylinders that come around the top of the cylinder and they certainly meet and go through. Now, I wouldn't describe it as boundary layers because it's low, actually low Reynolds number and lubrication theory is applicable in this when the cylinders are close together. But the air, um, the thin, very thin layer of air is a complication. And the pressure distribution in that thin layer of air is one of the key variables that has to be determined and is partly determined by the pressure in the tricuspidal bubble. Again, that's uh, to determine that pressure is part of the problem. Okay, well, I think uh, I have another question here um, from Sam. Will a tricuspidal bubble form, form if you had rotating spheres instead of cylinders? That's what I'm... Oh, rotating spheres. Yes. Uh, um, <laughs> that's a difficult one. No, I think that's, that's, uh, that's an experiment that has to be uh, tried. That's all I can say. I, I think it's likely if the two spheres are very close together, I think there will be a similar phenomenon. I think it'll be quasi two dimensional in the very small gap, but that's a little bit of a conjecture because we haven't tried that experiment and I'm not conscious that, that anyone else has, uh, has done so. Um, uh, there's no reason why it shouldn't really be a very nice experiment to do. Yeah. Well, thank you. I think on that note, it's a good time to wrap up uh, this uh, seminar and also this whole series. It's been a great uh, pleasure for me uh, partly to uh, help to organize this symposium in the first place and uh, in fact to edit uh, the memorial volume which contains 
uh, a large number of very interesting and fascinating papers of very high quality and it was a great pleasure for me to edit that volume i'd like also to follow keith's remarks and thank all our previous speakers in this series um, i think it has been a very great series and i'd also of course like to thank keith uh, for his uh, input throughout the whole process and in particular for this lecture this afternoon as always keith uh, comes up with uh, with great uh, ideas and problems and and now he's just suggested a new experiment so that's even even better so with that i, I would just simply say this is the last uh, seminar in this series and for this academic year um, it is not clear i think what to form uh, the seminar series will take uh, when we resume again uh, after the summer break um, so watch this space and uh, we hope that uh, we'll be able to reach a wide audience with whatever means that we do in the future.